Good morning. We're delighted that you have chosen to join us today for our study of God's Word. We hope that you're doing well, and we would love for you to come and be our guest today at Pyburn Street Church of Christ. We will gather this morning at 9 o'clock for Bible study, followed by worship at 9.50. We will come together again this evening at 6 o'clock for our monthly singing night and devotional, and we also gather on Wednesday evenings at 6 o'clock for midweek Bible study. We would love for you to come and be our guest at any or all of these upcoming services. Last week, we began looking at the subject of Jesus the Messiah. And as we came to the close of the lesson last week, I mentioned that we were going to pick up where we left off in that lesson. If you were not able to hear the first part of this lesson, you have the ability to go to youtube.com and search Pyburn Street Church of Christ and you'll be able to find that lesson as well as all of the lessons that are presented here over KPOC as well as those presented from the pulpit at Pyburn Street. Bethlehem was not a very large village. It probably had only one place to stay, one inn, and more than likely it would have been very small at that. So with the great influx of travelers that were coming there for the purpose of this census. We find that when Mary and Joseph are, are arrived in the city of Bethlehem, they found that the inn was already full, that there was nowhere to stay. Well, apparently in desperation, knowing that this child was about to be born, Joseph found the only accommodations that were available, a stable likely no more than a cave where animals were pinned in when the weather was bad. But this was something that would have to do. There had to be a place of shelter for Mary. And it's somewhat surprising to me the lack of emotion when Luke simply says that Mary wrapped her little lamb in strips of rags or swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger, Luke 2 and verse 7. You know how poignant the picture. Mary's own creator snuggled tenderly in her arms and laid in a feeding trough. At last, deity had begun this earthly pilgrimage so that man could one day walk with God. Eternity had stepped into time so that man could live forever. Royalty had forsaken the splendors of heaven to bring riches to a spiritually bankrupt world. Jesus had descended from heaven to become the apprentice to a common carpenter. We see that the Son of God had been born in a stable, not attended to by royal servants, but by the bleeding of sheep and the soft voice of a young virgin. Who could have known that 30 years later there would be another cave? This time there would be a tomb and there would again be the sound of the voices of peasants, those quiet sobs of the people there at the foot of the cross only a God of providence could have brought his son into the world in such a manner. And yet the symbolism of the events that transpired that night in Bethlehem is too striking for mere coincidence. Not only was Bethlehem the birthplace of the king upon whose throne Jesus would sit, its name literally meant house of bread. The words in Hebrew were simple enough. House, be it from the word Beth, and Laham is the Hebrew word for bread. Yet from this obscure village came the bread of life, and not only were shepherds the first to hear it, the good shepherd was the one that had arrived. And the shepherds that the angels appeared to, they came and they saw this newborn good shepherd. Angels announced the birth of this child to the shepherds. Now it's unclear as to exactly what time of year Jesus was born. 
Luke notes that there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night in Luke 2.8. But from what we know of shepherding, night vigils seem uncharacteristic. So what does Luke mean? Well, there are two possibilities. If this were springtime, then it would have been the time of birthing, and shepherds would have been keeping vigil for signs of new lambs that had been born. Well, could it be that the shepherd's eyes first witnessed heaven's sign that God's lamb had been born because of the, the comparison to the time of year? But there's another explanation as well that we could consider as to why shepherds were watching over their flocks by night. These shepherds may have been reserved for uh, special holy purposes. From time to time there would be flocks of sheep that would be separated out and certain shepherds would be assigned over those sheep because these sheep were the ones that were to be used in sacrifices that were to be offered in the temple. And if so, then the time of year is less significant as sacrifices had to be offered year-round. If so, then these were lambs who were destined to die, lambs whose blood would atone for Israel's sins. Well, could it be that the attendants of the sacrificial lambs were the first to hear about the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, as we see in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8? Well, whenever we consider the mission of God's Lamb, we see it summed up in a single arresting thought that Jesus was born to die. Jehovah is salvation, was his name. But the kind of salvation that man needed called for a price, a price that sheep and goats simply could not pay. And down through Israel's history, countless lambs had been slaughtered. Year after year, gallons of blood had dripped from the altar. But for all the centuries of carnage, not a single drop had the power to cleanse sin. The writer of Hebrews addresses this in Hebrews 10, the first four verses. God would have to provide something more, something much more, if his lost creation was to be cleansed. But if God was loving, and certainly he is, if God is merciful, and he is, if God is just, and he is, then how could the demands of such divine attributes be satisfied? Well, it wasn't hard to imagine God's love for man. He created him, and, and man could love God in return. It was not hard for man to beg for mercy when he did wrong. But that was just the problem. Man did wrong, and God's justice demanded punishment for sin. Sin produced a debt, and no amount of love in and of itself could lessen that debt. Sin was an affront to God's holiness, and sin deserved death. Justice demanded death. Yet even if men were to die for their own sins, what kind of payment would that be? By very definition, sinners were impure. But would a holy God accept impurity as atonement for sin? Well, of course not. So to sacrifice sinners for their own sins might be appropriate revenge, but it certainly would not satisfy the deepest demands of justice. And besides, the God whose perfect justice demanded condemnation for sin was the same who supremely loved the sinner. Well, were the objects of God's love to become the objects of his wrath? If so, then how was he a God of love? Well, heaven's solution to this seemingly hopeless dilemma was revealed in another divine attribute. God was not only a God of love, mercy, and justice, he was a God of grace. Indeed, salvation would be by grace. By grace, deity would come to earth to take on the image of humanity. We see in Philippians 2, 7, and God essentially would die for lost sinners, Ephesians 2, 7 through 8. Only heaven could have painted such a masterpiece in substitution. Man could not have devised the plan, and he certainly did not deserve it. 
Thus salvation by grace would be all to the glory of God. We read in Romans 5, verses 6 through 8, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Friends, the divine plan to redeem fallen humanity actually began long before the forbidden fruit ever touched Adam's lips. Before the garden, before creation's first day, knowing that man would sin, God already had a plan to save man through his Son, Jesus Christ. And of this grace, Paul reminded Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. He says, of this grace, Paul, we see him writing to the Ephesians, saying that through obedience to the gospel, they had been lovingly chosen and predestined to the adoption of sons, their redemption and cleansing affected by the blood of Christ, Ephesians 1, verses 4 through 7. Well, earthly speaking, the journey out of sin began as soon as Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden. There in the barren soil of man's rebellion, God planted a promise, and that promise was a seed promise. Someday a shoot would arise which would bring comfort to the world. The word in Hebrews or in Hebrew that is translated shoot or branch likely is the same root word behind the name Nazareth, the town where Jesus grew up. Thus, from humble beginnings in Shoot Town, the root of Jesse would spring forth to become the vine, as we see in John 15, 1, onto which Gentiles would someday be grafted, Romans 11 and verse 17. So we see many connections here. Well, after Adam and Eve were driven from the paradise that God had placed them into, we see that this was in response to rebellion on their part. And while they once were sinless and perfect, Romans 8, 20 through 22 says that, that man now groaned and travailed because of sin. Thus, by the sweat of his brow, Adam would would till a thorn-laden soil until he returned to its dust by reason of death. And Eve, being the mother of all living, would see her joy in childbirth be marred by pain. But we see that even with this dark, foreboding storm of sin taking place, God placed a rainbow amid streaks of, of lightning that was displaying the power of evil in this world. We see that God promised the radiance of the sunshine. Satan's reign was going to be powerless to drown even the most tender of herbs, Isaiah 53, 2. And for out of dry ground, the root of Jesse would rise to rule over the nations, Isaiah 11 and verse 10. And someday the seed of woman would crush Satan's head, Genesis 3:15. Folks, this is an amazing promise that stands as the focal point of Scripture. Redemption's fruitful boughs flourish in the Almighty's covenant. To the childless Abraham, God promised that through his seed all nations of the earth would be blessed, Genesis 12, 1 through 4. In reality, all that God did in and through Israel was simply a working out of that pledge, as we see in Galatians 3, verses 16 through 19. Now, no one understood the mission of Christ any better than himself. For we see at the tender age of 12, Jesus was already telling his mother that he had to be in his father's house, Luke 2 and verse 49. Joseph's son realized whose son he was, and he knew that sonship required humble obedience, even death on the cross, as we see in Philippians 2 and verse 8. Friends, we want to thank you for joining us for our study today, and we encourage you to join us again next Sunday morning at 8 o'clock as we continue our study of Jesus, the Messiah. We hope that God blesses you today with a wonderful Lord's Day.